A homeomorphism is a function between topological spaces that is bijective and continuous with a continuous inverse, or bicontinuous. In the previous video of this series, we talked about why the punctured sphere and R2 are topological spaces, with their respective topologies, which I'm naming tau A and tau B. And this is where tau A is the standard subspace topology on the punctured sphere, and tau B is just the standard topology on R2. This is how we'll define our topological spaces for this part of the series. Also in this video, we'll dive into bijectivity and bicontinuity, then ultimately prove the homeomorphism between the punctured sphere and plane. Now, looking back at this definition, it can really just be simplified to a bicontinuous function, because continuous functions are always between spaces with topologies, and and the existence of an inverse function is dependent on bijectivity. We should thus start off with bijectivity. Suppose we have two spaces, x and y. These don't have to be topological spaces. You can think of them as just pure spaces that are equal to sets of points or arbitrary columns of elements. Consider an arbitrary function h from x to y with a one-to-one -one correspondence between the elements of the spaces. This one-to-one -one correspondence means that h is bijective. It turns out that a function is bijective if and only if it's both injective and surjective. Let's rearrange this function h to just be injective and not surjective. An injective function maps distinct elements to distinct elements. Now, as you can see, no element of x maps to the same element of y. This guarantees that there's at most one preimage for each element in y. Injectivity still holds true if the size of x is less than y. Rearranging to a purely surjective function, for surjective functions, every element of y has at least one preimage. This time, the size of y is allowed to be less than that of x. Now, bijective functions, which are both injective and surjective, thus produce a one-to-one -one correspondence between the elements of the two sets. The reasoning behind this is that if the elements of y have at least, and at most, one preimage, the elements of y must have exactly one preimage, making the sizes of x and y the same. So that's what makes bijective functions invertible. We say a function is bijective if and only if it's invertible, meaning that we start off in y, plug its elements elements into some inverse function and end up with x. The existence of an inverse function is the main role bijectivity plays in homeomorphisms. By looking at this map, I hope you can visually interpret why it's bijective. Here, for each point of the punctured sphere, we get exactly one other unique point of R2. And because of this, we can map the plane right back to where it came from under the inverse function. Here are the stereographic projection functions between a centered at origin unit sphere and the xy plane at height z equals negative 1. To prove f is bijective, we can do this by proving f is invertible, meaning we need to show that g is f inverse. To do this, we can use function compositions and show that g of f of p equals p and f of g of q equals q. This means that when you plug the output of f into the input of g, you get the input of f, and when you plug the output of g into the input of f, you get the input of g. Proving bijectivity in this case consists of a bunch of t algebra. If you really want to see these functions reduced step by step, just check out section 3 of the link to the paper on the stereographic projection homeomorphism proof. Now that we know g truly is f inverse, let's refer to g as f inverse for the rest of this first proof. Great, we know that we're working with topological spaces and we know that our stereographic projection function is bijective. Now that we've found f inverse, we're going to need to prove that both f and f inverse are continuous to prove this first homeomorphism. So so let's dive into what it means to be continuous. By choice, I will teach this in a purely topological sense. Now, before continuity, I want to quickly explain how the standard topology describes points being arbitrarily close. Here, if we consider an open neighborhood of some point where the neighborhood is an element of tau sub rn, no matter the size or shape of the neighborhood, the point will always appear with distinct surrounding points that are also in the neighborhood. Let's now zoom in and consider a smaller neighborhood. As you can see, there exist new distinct surrounding points contained in this new neighborhood. We can again zoom in and find a new neighborhood with new close surrounding points, and this goes on forever. This holds true for all open neighborhoods of a point in the standard topology because no point ever appears as an isolated singleton in the standard topology. Okay, now here's the definition for continuity at a point between two topological spaces. 
since f is already being used, we'll say that a function h from a topological space x to a topological space y is continuous at some point little x and big x if and only if for every open neighborhood v of h of x there exists an open neighborhood u of x such that u is a subset of the preimage of v. And this is where the preimage of v is the set of all little x and big x such that h of x is in v. Also, if u is a subset of this preimage, from the definition of a preimage, we can say that h of u needs to be a subset of v. Both options mean the same thing. This definition holds true for all v, therefore it must hold true for arbitrarily small v, which, remember, will all appear with distinct surrounding points of h of x, if v is a standard open subset. Now, as v gets arbitrarily small, this forces h of u to also become arbitrarily small, or h of u can possibly equal a singleton. Notice how h of u U doesn't have to be open. Also, in case you were wondering, it turns out that as v gets smaller, the preimage can possibly remain the same size, or the preimage can get smaller as v gets smaller. Now, the intuition behind this definition is that if I pick a point, call it x star, in this existent u neighborhood for some arbitrarily small v neighborhood, it's guaranteed that the image of x star will be either arbitrarily close to h of x, or it can equal h of x itself. The general concept behind this is that continuous functions between standard real spaces map arbitrarily close points to arbitrarily close points, or to possibly the same point. This is also why no tearing is allowed by continuous functions. Now, if a continuous function is bijective, or at least injective, arbitrarily close points will always map to arbitrarily close points points. For a good example of this notarian concept, consider this bijective and continuous function that maps the interval square bracket 0, 1, parenthesis, to a complex unit circle defined as mu of t equals e to the it. Here, function mu maps distant points to arbitrarily close points, which is a form of gluing and is perfectly acceptable under continuous mappings. So, this forward function from the interval to the circle is continuous, and there's also a one-to-one -one correspondence, making it bijective. However, mu inverse is not continuous. The inverse takes points that are arbitrarily close and tears them apart. If if the inverse function was also continuous, then there would be no tearing in the backwards direction, which is the same as no gluing in the forwards direction. This is why homeomorphic or bicontinuous functions imply no tearing or gluing and thus the number of holes is preserved, because creating a hole can be thought of as a form of tearing and patching a hole can be thought of as a form of gluing. The coffee cup donut transformation is a great example of a homeomorphism because some areas shrink, some areas grow, and other areas areas bend, but we're not tearing or gluing it anywhere. Alright, looking back at our definition of continuity, this describes continuity at a point. If there exists an open ball around each element in the preimage that's completely contained in the preimage, then surely there's an open ball around x that's completely contained in the preimage. And this open ball qualifies as one of these u neighborhoods. Hence, all we need to do is show that the preimage of each v of h of x is open because open sets are generally equal to unions of basis elements. Here we have a definition for continuity at a point. If we want to simplify even further, Further, we can say that a function is continuous at all points of the domain space whose output is well defined if and only if every open subset v of y has an open preimage that's a subset of x. For this definition, I like to explicitly write out the topologies. We say that h from x tau x to y tau y is continuous precisely if for all v elements of tau y, the preimage of v is in tau x. This is the cleanest definition of continuity in my opinion. Now that we see the bigger picture of continuity, looking at our stereographic projection function, we can prove that f is continuous at all points of the punctured sphere, precisely if an arbitrary open subset v that's an element of tau b has an open preimage that's an element of tau a. And this is where tau b is the standard topology on our plane, and tau a is the standard subspace topology on our punctured sphere. Showing an arbitrary open subset has an open preimage is the same as showing every open subset has an open preimage. Likewise, our inverse stereographic projection function is 
continuous precisely if for some open subset, call it u in tau a, the image f of u is in tau b. All right, from here, I'd like to inform you that our stereographic projection function f maps circles from our sphere to circles in the plane. There is an exception for when the circle of the sphere contains the north pole, in that case, the circle gets sent to a line which contains the point at infinity. Thus, this line is actually homeomorphic to a circle, but we haven't proven that yet, and we're excluding the North Pole from our proof for now, so there's no need to worry. I even made a whole separate video covering this proof. I highly recommend checking it out. The link's in the description. From the video, we can define a circle of our punctured sphere as follows, and this is where n1, n2, and n3 are coordinates of a unit normal vector, not the North Pole. This definition of a circle comes from the dot product. The image of a circle, which I'll call f of circle, is the following set of points. f of circle is a real Euclidean circle in our plane. In a separate proof, very similar, we can show that inverse stereographic projection maps circles to circles. We start off with one of these circles in the plane and show that f inverse of circle is some circle of our punctured sphere. In a similar sense, our forward function maps open balls to open balls, where these open balls of the punctured sphere are really just open sphere caps. If C is an element of our punctured sphere, a ball of the punctured sphere centered at C can be defined as all of the point P elements of the punctured sphere such that the distance between C and P is less than some real number R. And because it's a ball of the punctured sphere, R must be less than or equal to the distance between C and the North Pole. The distance metric here is not the Euclidean metric. Instead, it's the great circle distance metric, which comes from the dot product between vector elements of a sphere. Okay, so if we take this ball and follow the same steps as the circle to circle proof, we end up with the image f of ball. f of ball matches the definition of an open Euclidean ball of R2. Therefore, stereographic projection maps open balls of the punctured sphere to open Euclidean balls in R2. Likewise, f inverse maps the open Euclidean balls of R2 to the open balls of the punctured sphere. Now, if f inverse maps open balls to open balls, we know that f inverse maps collections of open balls in the plane to collections collections of open balls on the punctured sphere. As a reminder, the open Euclidean balls in our plane are basis elements for the plane's standard topology. So, we can set some open subset V in the plane equal to a union of these open Euclidean balls in the plane. And since V is open, V is an element of tau B. Now, since V is equal to a union of these balls, the pre-image of V must equal the pre-image of the union of these balls. We can then bring F inverse to the inside of this union, and F inverse maps open balls in the plane to open balls of the punctured sphere. Since topologies have closure under arbitrary unions, the union of all all these open balls of the punctured sphere must be an element of tau a. We have now shown that some arbitrary v element of tau b has an open preimage in tau a, and this matches the definition of our forward function being continuous, so we can officially say that f is continuous. In a similar sense to rn, these open balls of sn are the basis elements for an n-sphere's standard subspace topology. Why? Well, suppose we have some w element of the standard topology on r3. W intersected with S2 is, by definition, an element of the subspace topology on S2. Since the open Euclidean balls of R3 induce the standard topology on R3, we can set W equal to a union of open Euclidean balls of R3. After rearranging some parentheses, we can show that an arbitrary element of the subspace topology on S2 is equal to a union of balls of R3 intersected with S2 for each ball. This means that these intersections are the basis elements of the subspace topology, and it can be proven that one of these intersections can equal an open ball of S2, the empty set, or S2 itself, and we can omit the empty set and S2 from this basis. Likewise, the same concept holds true for a punctured sphere. Because of all this, to prove f inverse is continuous, we can set some open subset u in tau a equal to a union of open balls of the punctured sphere, and the image of this union will likewise be an element of tau b and this means that f inverse is continuous. All right, I hope you have a deeper understanding of why f and f inverse are continuous. To sum things up, though I'm not explicitly showing the topologies, it's safe to say that our stereographic projection function between the punctured sphere and R2 is a bijective, bicontinuous function between two topological spaces. Therefore, our punctured sphere and plane are homeomorphic. Hooray! Thanks for watching part two of this series.